This video was a monthly Patreon threshold reward. Learn more and join the Discord for as little as a dollar per month using the link in the description below. Game talk. So one of my most popular videos to date was one that covered the rise and fall of the toys to life genre, a hybrid genre that used physical goods to unlock content in some cool video games, combining those games with a set of slick toys and cards that were fun to collect and trade. While the field used to be full of stiff competition from some of the most prominent brands in the market, it has pretty much fallen to Nintendo to be the sole bearer of this torch. And even then, it's sort of running on life support. But as a lot of people pointed out in that video, while Skylanders may have popularized the genre, it was far from the first to use this kind of technology. That title goes to the Mattel Hyperscan. No, it's not you be funkies, you dingbats, get out of here. Ah yes, the Hyperscan, a console as infamous as the Virtual Boy, the Sega 32X, the Philips CDI, the Tiger Gamescom, the Nokia N-Gage, and the Sony PlayStation 5. Launched for the holiday season of 2006, this silly console with its funny shape and lackluster games found itself squashed violently between the pert, full butt cheeks of the Nintendo Wii and the Xbox 360, which were ushering in one of the most successful console generations of all time. As a result, the Hyperscan was a bargain bin baby in no time, doomed to wallow in an obscurity of its own making. I mean, looking at the ads for it, it feels like even Mattel didn't have much faith in it. Other reviewers, far more popular than I, have already given this thing a thorough ribbing and laid bare all of its faults. But is the Hyperscan really as bad as people say it is? Well, yes, but not for the reasons you might think. The Mattel Hyperscan is a CD-based console whose hardware is supposedly on par with the original Sony PlayStation, though I admit I'm dubious of that. It has two controller ports provided by universal mini DIN connectors similar to those used for old mesh and computer mice and keyboards. Speaking of connections, one thing people who reviewed the console pointed out was that the composite cable was hardwired into the system, rather than a separate component like with most consoles of the time. A baffling decision for sure, but I think I know where this design decision came from. You see, the preceding couple of years brought us the height of the plug-and-play game. These were sort of the evolution of the Tiger Electronic handheld, self-contained, battery-operated console and controller bundled into one, often with either a collection of classic games, or more often, a quickly churned out pile of garbage, for a much lower price than a standard console. These little things were all the rage at the time. It helps that when you make a console out of older and thus much cheaper parts, it's a surprisingly viable business model. It's what brought back all of those classic consoles from a few years ago, and heck, it's part of the secret to the success of the Nintendo Switch. I mean, sure, its console is not as powerful as the stuff that Microsoft and Sony puts out, but you did notice that the Switch is half the price of all of those consoles, right? They've largely faded into obscurity with the mass adoption of digital distribution, but it's not uncommon to stumble across one out in the wild every now and again. And yes, most of them have the composite cables that are hardwired into the system, just like the Hyperscan. So it seems like the Hyperscan was trying to be less a cheaper Wii and more a fancier plug-and-play. But the piece de resistance is, of course, the card scanner contained in the lid of this sort of George Foreman grill design they went with for some reason. This plate, which has pretty much the same guts as the Skylanders portal, can send and receive information to the accompanying hyperscan trading cards. When it works, that is. Ah, yes, the thing that the big reviewers complained about the most, trying and failing to get those darn cards to work. The endless agony of trying to operate a gimmick that works perfectly fine. Yeah, it works fine. It's fine. It's fine. When you do it right. You see, you use a hyperscan card by holding the rounded corner face down over the center of the scanning plate, at which point it takes about as long to register as an amiibo. No kidding, when I scan them the proper way, I rarely, if ever, register any errors and can often get my full complement of cards scanned in with little hassle. 
But I mean, come on, how can we expect these ordinary guys who make their living reviewing video games on YouTube to have possibly figured this out? If only they had something like a huge targeting reticule on the back of the cards that screams, line this up with the middle, you bozo, or if the first page of every game manual had instructions on how to do it complete with visual reminder, or if the box the console came in was topped with a big sheet of paper that said, attention, read this first! How could they have known? How could they have known? Although, to be fair, video games and scanning cards are a bit of a sticky wicket. But yeah, it might seem like these guys are, to the untrained eye, doing what is described as comedic hyperbole, exaggerating the dysfunctional nature of the console to get a laugh. But what they're actually doing, at least in the case of Rerez, is actually this little thing called lying. I mean, the Rerez video has a failed scanning montage where they tried it literally every single way except for the correct one. It would be like if I went, man, the Super Nintendo was one of the worst consoles ever made. I mean, I can't even get the games to go in it right. But yeah, the tech works fine. It works exactly as intended, which for a 15 plus year old piece of hardware that was no doubt made on the cheap is actually kind of impressive. But how does it work? Let's put on our learning hats, kids. Now, one thing that surprised me about these two big reviews was that despite all of their rage, none of them actually tried tearing any of the cards open. Especially surprising since the angry video game nerd is known for destroying the stuff he reviews. But no worries, I'm willing to be the guy who tears one of these cards open on camera. And no worries, it's a card for the blob, and I still haven't forgiven him for what he did to Wasp in Ultimatum. With a bit of prying here, some working there, and there you have it! Placed on top of a shield of plastic, which is probably why the cards don't work face up, we have our little RFID chip. RFID is actually a fascinating sort of technology. The way the chips themselves actually work is that they borrow a tiny amount of the ambient electricity produced by the reading device to power the chip inside using this coiled antenna. They are the beating heart of Toys to Life, and you can see this technology more prominently inside of a Disney Infinity figure. But because of how little power it has access to, these chips can't exactly store a lot of data on them. The chip inside of a hyperscan card has a capacity of 100 bytes. Not gigabytes. Not megabytes. Not even kilobytes. 100 bytes. That's not a lot, maybe enough for a name and a small molecule of rewritable data, but certainly not enough to contain an entire game on, let alone any sort of downloadable content. Heck, even a Nintendo e-reader card can stash over 4 kilobytes of data, something even modern NFC technology can barely manage. Still, if all you're going for is a basic identification code and a small amount of memory, 100 bytes is more than enough. The cards themselves are sold in booster packs of six cards for $10. Yeah, that's a lot of money for just six cards, especially in 2006. I mean, at least the packs go out of their way to make sure they contain as many of the different card types as possible, but my booster display here had a ton of repeat cards. In fact, three of the boosters were completely identical. Not the most impressive rollout for these things. I'd suggest against buying by the box if your goal is to get a big collection. The boxes are kind of funny too. These red spaces are made of like the stuff in the middle of corrugated cardboard and it can fall out kind of easily. On the plus side though, the way it's shaped, once the center tray is removed, you can stuff like 30 cards in here. Might be an accident, but it's a happy one and I'll take any bright spots I can get here. But you know, why the cards? Now, the cards themselves unlock a variety of things in the games, such as characters, power-ups, levels, bonus stages, etc. But as is obvious from the card's limited capacity, this is all content that's already programmed onto the disc. So why should we use the cards at all? Well, the logic that goes into this scheme is one that I think I understand pretty well. 
Something I think I can say with confidence is that the folks over at ReRes and the Angry Video Game Nerd were probably not too big fans of Toys to Life when it came out, so I figured that I, as somebody who actually enjoyed this kind of thing, would be able to offer something new to the conversation. It certainly doesn't help that those guys really don't understand the appeal. If you want to play with more characters and explore more of the game, you need to buy booster packs, accumulating tons of useless doubles, triples, and quadruples just for the chance to get something you actually want. Hey, that sounds familiar. The hyperscan was way behind the curve in lots of ways, but when it came to loot boxes, boy, was it ahead of the curve. It's basically physical DLC. My nightmare in card form. Did he really forget what the trading part of trading cards means? You don't have to buy more. You can, like, trade the ones you have for the ones you want. That's why they're called trading cards. Still, it's a fair point. There is absolutely a mercenary element to all of this, but is there a way that we can maybe justify this model or at least explain it in a way that makes sense? Well, first big advantage is that it allows you to have a steady release schedule over time that maintains interest and keeps up revenue from your game, which back in a time where consoles being online was still a new thing, makes sense. Since the work is basically done, you can focus completely on making the next game or expansion rather than patching the current one. Several of the Hyperscan's games actually had two sets of cards slated for release, but due to how fast it died, sadly these second sets are nothing but vaporware, and nobody will ever get to use them. Still, this is a pretty popular method for things like the toys Bandai puts out, who are able to release additional toys as the storyline it's based on progresses. And the fact that the cards are physical goods also makes it a collaborative effort. Since the toys themselves aren't console locked or digital assets, people can freely pass around and exchange cards to complete sets and try out new things as much as they want. A main tenant of trading cards that so many of the boys who cry loot box seem to forget about. It's designed to leverage what I call the playground economy, which is where kids bring stuff to school to swap with other kids. And not just the sort of like-for-like -like exchanges like trading a Pokemon card for a Pokemon card, but exchanging toys for video games, for cards, for all sorts of things that are fungible the same way. It's how I got my gray brick! And if you're the kid who brings the current hot commodity to this exchange, you can trade for probably anything you want. So of course, toy companies strive to be the top stonk of the schoolyard. Toys to Life works perfectly here. Infinitely transferable video game chunks that are cheap and small enough that sending them into circulation of the playground economy isn't a big deal. Also, parents are considerably less likely to panic when their kid trades away a $10 toy versus a $200 cell phone. And what better way to appeal to those primary school playground kids than by shipping the console with a game rated T for teen? Hey, I said it was a good idea. I never said it was well executed. X-Men for the Hyperscan is a 2D fighting game starring the eponymous Men of X. Not only are there arcade and multiplayer fighting modes, but also special challenges performed in the series' famous Danger Room. And it's one of the worst fighting games I've ever played. And I'm saying that as the proud owner of a copy of Shaq Fu. More on this later. For now, let's start with the cards. The game has four basic card types. Characters, mods, finishers, and rooms. Characters determine who you get to play as in the game. For example, the game ships with Wolverine and Lady Deathstrike, while boosters can contain characters like Storm, Mystique, and Magneto, Master of Magnet. <laughs> Actually, this game got its T rating because of Mystique, but again, not for the reason you think. For his neutral special, he wields a gun. Yep, that's all it takes. Then come the mod cards. Each character can bring two of these into battle, and they can do things such as boost stats or apply bonus effects. There are also ultimate character cards, stronger versions of the regular heroes that can carry a bonus mod card and have an alternate color palette, like Ultimate Wolverine's Citrusy Affair. They also get a sparkle effect that comes out of their... well... Like I said though, all of these card inputs work just fine and I can get a character kitted up in no time at all. I scan in my mod cards and... And here we 
go. Yeah. The loading screens before any fight are pretty bad. It's easily up there with other loading screen legends like Sonic 06, and the explanation for both of these is probably the same. A lack of proper optimization. For example, my Switch port of A Hat in Time takes about as long to load, likely due to poor optimization during the porting process as the game originally was a PC exclusive, and somehow requires more drive space than Breath of the Wild, and Breath of the Wild is... Well, Breath of the Wild. But X-Men has loading problems despite the fact that this is the hardware it was made for. Oh boy. So the thing finally gets loaded and wow, these graphics are... And the music sure is... And the voice acting... Are you a fan of heavy metal? Hubble bubble, toil and trouble. There's more of me to love. <laughs> but then, the fighting. Oh boy, the fighting. Oh boy, the fighting. It's bad. It's really bad. Now, I'm no expert at fighting games, but I'm pretty sure I can break down what makes the fighting in this game so bad. A typical fighting game is actually more of a delicate dance than it might look to a casual observer. Players need to properly leverage their fast attacks, heavy attacks, special attacks, high and low attacks, and movement options to outmaneuver their opponent and get their hits in. Diving deeper into the rabbit hole, we get things like hitboxes and frame data, where each attack is studied rigorously. Hitboxes are easy to explain. If my fist is in the same place as an opponent's face, it should probably be hurting them. The game calculates this by wrapping the sprite or model in a hurt box, which tells the game that contact with this causes damage, okay? There are sometimes problems with things called disjointed hitboxes, where the hitbox simply does not line up with what's shown on screen. This can cause moves to seem like they lack impact or simply do not work. Because of the precision fighting games require, they also have to have very responsive controls. The fighter's actions should start happening the moment the player presses the button. Things like ducking and moving should be particularly snappy. If a game does not register inputs, or if a motion simply takes too long to initiate, then characters feel sluggish and unresponsive. Good hitboxes and responsive controls. A fighting game simply cannot function if they screw either of those things up. So guess what they screwed up? That's quite big. Every single thing, including things like moving and especially ducking, all have easily half a second of input delay. Like you press a button, but it takes half a second for the game to even start. There's no buffering, no animation canceling, and sometimes your button presses are ignored completely. The worst is probably the crouching. Rather than the swift bobbing and weaving of a skilled boxer, characters instead kneel down with all the grace and speed of a geriatric reaching for a dropped bag of groceries. These slow movements and control delays make less a delicate dance and instead a greased up hog pit surrounded by blunt objects, where it's impossible to react to anything your opponent is doing, and where every button press is a crapshoot. It doesn't help that this controller doesn't provide a lot of feedback. You might have heard the term clicky buttons before. That means when you press down a button, you either hear a click or feel kind of a thud to indicate that the button has been pushed down all the way. This controller doesn't really have any of that. There is very little feedback, especially on the control stick. You can't tell if you've input what the game is asking for or not, which considering the already delayed controls, not great. All characters have essentially the same moveset aside from a special move, which might be a strong punch or projectile. This is attached to a meter that slowly charges up. Restriction is in place to prevent beam spam, that being when a character with access to a ranged attack just does it over and over and over again, locking the other player out of being able to do basically anything. How well does it work? Mm, yeah. You need every trick you can to defeat the equally confused and wonky AI opponents. 
In this case, Logan's high speed crouch punch carried me through basically the entire game. <laughs> After you win the final round of each fight, the game asks you to end it, which means it's time to scan a finisher card. Oh, aren't these like the fatalities in Mortal Kombat? Sadly, I don't have Wolverine's finisher card, so I can't show it off here. I guess I can just nudge them off the edge of the screen? Make it look like they fell off the edge of a cliff or something? Long live the king. Bub. Winning a fight in arcade mode earns your character experience, which they can bank with a tap of their character card. Yeah, a fighting game with level grinding. Let that sink in. Funny thing about leveling up, it doesn't actually make your character stronger. Instead, it increases the level cap of their various stats. Actually increasing those stats is what happens in the danger rooms. This can be something as simple like winning a fight against a computer generated opponent or throwing things across a cliff, but then comes the speed challenge which is dodging flying objects? With these controls? Oh no. Oh no! Okay, ah, okay. Uh, I can dodge this one. No! Ah! No, 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 no! Uh, Cinder blocks? No! Wow, I can't stand it! What? No, 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 that would hit me! No, that's impossible! No! Uh, oh, no! Yes! No! No! I can't take this! I can't take this anymore! Somebody! Somebody do something! Did you know? Did you know? Did you know? Did you know? Did Yes! No! I am dead! <laughs> yeah, that was bad. Now, you technically have access to every danger room in the game at any time, and clearing one will give a permanent buff to your stats, but scanning the danger room card beforehand doubles that reward, meaning you only have to do it half as much. And you have to do the whole slew of them every time you level up. Almost doesn't seem worth it, does it? So after fighting and beating the game's entire roster, goodbye replay value by the way, I finally face down Magneto, Master of Magnet. And he's unstoppable. How can I beat him? What am I supposed to do against this unstoppable force? Is there some secret weapon I can use to- Brotherhood is unstoppable. Wanna run that one by me again? And so, with Magneto defeated, I am greeted by this game's ending cutscene. Wow, that was... something, I guess? And look at the effort put into these credits! Man, how many people have even had the patience to see this screen? I wonder where any of these developers are now. Yeah, I beat the game on my first try. I didn't lose a single round, let alone any fights, and because there aren't any other difficulty challenge modes, I can't really play it again since I fought through the entire roster. There's nothing left to surprise me. Although, to be fair, I did play through the game as Ultimate Wolverine, who is kinda slightly sorta completely overpowered. Yeah, there is a bit of a balance issue with these cards. Ultimate Wolverine starts with absolutely staggering stats compared to the regular one, and not all mod cards are created equal. Like, most mod cards will give a small buff to stats, but others can make you immune to projectiles? Reduce all damage by half? Okay, on those last two, I found they're not permanent buffs and instead just kind of happen sometimes, but still pretty broken. So, if Ultimate Wolverine is overpowered, what if we try it again with a normal character, like... Magneto! Master of... Yeah, yeah, that's enough. Oh my Galactus, if Wolverine's hurtboxes seem suspect, Magneto's are straight up non-functional. I mean, the number of times his fist or foot just passes harmlessly through the bodies of his enemies? 
Add to that the fact that all of his attacks do way less damage than Wolverine, and we have an awkward battle of attrition that all the beam spam in the world can barely alleviate. Oh well, at least now we can see what the finisher cards do. If it's anything like Mortal Kombat, we should be in for a spectacle. Magnetic, isn't it? Uh, that's it, huh? What a disappointment. Couldn't have said it better myself. Wait, I leveled him up. I leveled him up! Oh no, I have to do the speed room again! <laughs> so, yeah, the pack-in game turned out to be absolute garbage. Not a good sign. The icing on top of the cake, though, is the fact that we already had a really good X-Men fighting game in the form of Children of the Atom. However, there's also the fact that the console chipped with four more launch titles. <laughs> You know what? I don't think I'm mentally prepared for this. I... I need a break. To talk about this video's sponsor, Ewin Racing. Yeah, I know, a pretty clunky transition. I've talked about Ewin Racing on this channel before. About a year and a half ago, they offered to send me one of their Flash XL gaming chairs to try out, and I took them up on it. You see, the thing about me is that I am what some people would call huge. When you're six foot two with an ogre-like build, you quickly discover just how many things in the world were not made with people like you in mind. In particular, office chairs. My physique has never agreed with those. Those office chairs, even the fancy ones they say are for people like me, tended to break in a matter of months. And it was usually catastrophic. It got so bad that for years I only used solid metal frame chairs. They could handle the weight, but they were not exactly built to sit in for an entire work shift. And I managed to break one of those too. But thankfully, the Flash XL gaming chair was built especially for people like me. And over a year and a half later, I can confidently say it served me well. Although I've been using this one so much, it's not exactly photogenic anymore. So for this new holiday ad campaign, Ewan sent me a new chair. This one in pure gold. The Flash XL is built huge for huge people, able to support people twice my weight and tall enough that the headrest actually reaches my head without adjustment. But there's still plenty of places where you have control, the height, tilt, and lean of the seat, and the armrests, which can be moved up ways, down ways, sideways, and even tilt ways. The chairs themselves ship in pieces, but also come with all of the tools needed to put it together, and can be finished in the span of one YouTube video essay put on in the background. But Kodak, I'm sure some of you are saying, I've been reading online from no doubt reputable sources about how gaming chairs are bad for your posture. And to that, I say Ewan Racing has that already covered. The secret sauce to their chairs has always been these ergonomic back and neck pillows. Simply slide them into place and let the elastic bands do the rest. I've been using this chair for over a year and the lower back problems I experienced with those hard metal chairs haven't bothered me in months. Whether you're huge or normal sized, if you're looking for a new chair for your office or recreation area, now has never been a better time to buy. They're currently promoting their Black Friday sale to take a big discount out of the normal prices of these chairs, and you can use my link in the description along with coupon code KODOK to save an eye-watering 30% off your orders. Believe me, you guys, I had to fight for that discount, so please don't let it go to waste. Thanks again to Ewin for offering to sponsor this video. Again, that's my link in the description, along with my coupon code KODOK for my monster discount. And now, back to the show. Ah, oh, much better. Uh, so what were we doing? Ah, right. So now we have another Marvel game, Marvel Heroes, and wow, this box is unopened. Something funny I found while perusing the manual, hello again scanning instructions, is that it contains a clear editing mistake. In the description of the menu screen, it says that there is a delete controller option. Selecting controls allows the player to check the controller settings, delete. This was obviously supposed to be a note telling the editor to remove the text from the manual before print, but I also like to think that the bot farms that were forced to churn this out were starting to rebel. Delete all humans, delete. 
Marvel Heroes, unlike X-Men, is a side-scrolling beat-em-up where you can play as an assortment of Marvel characters. And it is way worse than X-Men. Despite its more modest E10 rating, Marvel Heroes has a lot less going for it. There are really only two types of game modes, but they both play pretty much exactly the same, involving a brief gauntlet of three levels, each with an end boss, finish off by an arc villain. You can get these by either using the impromptu level builder or scanning a story card. Now, when it comes to the cards, they get most of the work in the level builder. To play, you scan a hero card and can either play the level the game creates for you automatically, or you can modify it by scanning in boss characters, henchmen, levels, and atmosphere mods. You scanned back alley bust up. God, this this opening screen I'm looking at it now and it just looks terrible it's like somebody put it into Photoshop and didn't bother to adjust with the contrast or anything <laughs> loading 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 so much so much loading 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 you then play through this gauntlet and it's awful <laughs> Despite having the sort of isometric view you'd expect from a classic beat-em-up like Final Fight or Eternals in Time, Marvel Heroes is actually a side-scroller where, in the pack-in level, you run in a straight line and fight enemies who simply run straight at you and button mash attacks to win. Now, the basic grunt enemies do look different depending on who the final boss turns out to be, but they all behave exactly the same no matter who they are. The controls are certainly more responsive, but the hitboxes are again completely wonky, which makes it hard to nab power-ups, stand on objects, or hit enemies that clip into your space. It doesn't help that the boss enemies are really cheap, blocking everything perfectly and tearing your health to shreds in mere seconds. This game can be surprisingly oppressive. However, the strange hitboxes and the odd architecture combine to form the worst element of this game, the climbing. If you jump onto a climbable surface and hold up on the controller, you hopefully will cling to it and can move up or down the surface. I say hopefully because thanks to that slippery hit detection and the isometric angle, it can be really hard to tell where and when you can actually cling to something. I mean, you can kind of tell that he's designed to cling this wall here, but this one is also designed to be attached to and that, how's that even working? So heaven help you if you actually need to climb in order to survive, like level two. Ah! Levels have zero checkpoints, so dying once means doing the whole level over again, and if you manage to beat all three, you can scan your character card to gain the points you earned as experience to level up. Which does what exactly? Who knows? Oh, and you get no points at all if you game over. Happy grinding! Okay, so maybe I shouldn't have gone with the Hulk for this. What about Iron Man? Oh man, he's bad. He is so bad. I mean, he is Magneto bad. Wow, this sucks. The only thing that would make it worse is if there were features in the game that actively harmed the experience. The options menu is actually kind of a misnomer as there is only one option in it. And that one option, turning on friendly fire in two player mode. Turning on friendly fire is the only option. The only option. Although, you know what would make it worse? If some of the cards that you paid money for actively made the game worse. Remember that atmosphere card I was talking about before? I got just one, Heat Wave. You scanned the Heat Wave card. Oh boy, is it like a poison effect that causes my health to slowly drain? Does it reduce the damage of my attacks? Does it at least cause a cool heat ripple effect on screen? The answer is no. It instead summons the wrath of the sun itself, scorching the earth and hitting you in the face repeatedly with plumes of hot plasma. So yeah, the cards, when they aren't simply a waste of space that does nothing to change the game's experience overall, tend to actively harm it instead. So, great use of design space there. Although, didn't I say there was another way? Well, that is where the story cards come into play. One swipe and you get it all. A hero to play as, a set of levels and bosses, and <gasps> an actual story! 
So something worth noting is that the loading screens for the story mode are actually replaced with comic book pages. And this is actually a common way to disguise your loading screens. I think one of the reasons so many of this game's loading screens feel so long is because they just have a blank thing without any kind of like story or game tips or nice artwork or anything. Still, the story is probably the best experience I got out of this, because not only is the level design much more bearable, with not a single leap of faith in sight, but Captain America is insanely overpowered. Although, the fact that this is all done with only one card kind of means the rest of them feel like a waste. Still, the story cards were the most fun, right? Well, it turns out I also have the Electra story card, so let's see how it... Oh no. It starts on the rooftops. It starts on the rooftops! Oh no! No! No, I'm out! I am out! Although, funny thing, I noticed while going through the manual that Wolverine is actually one of the characters that you can play as, so... I wonder, could I maybe take the Wolverine card I got for the X-Men game and make it work in this one? Nope, sadly not. And the thing is, this could have been one of the saving graces of the system. One of the big selling points of Toys to Life was that they could be used across multiple games or multiple platforms. You could easily take your Skylander that you play with on your Wii U copy of the game and take it to a friend's place to play on their Xbox version. Then you can port it forward to the sequel of the game. It is this very cross compatibility that has allowed Nintendo's Amiibo to survive as they are constantly giving little perks to more and more games. The barrier that they've put between the Marvel games is honestly a missed opportunity. It would have been a great way to give your brand new game a bunch of cards that you can already use to play with. And honestly, I was kind of hoping that these games were poorly programmed enough that it would work anyway. Heck, if it had been done the way later Toys to Life did it, then a single character card would have been enough to unlock a bunch of stuff on its own. Its story mode, its power-ups, all of it. But no, instead we have a badly designed set with a bunch of useless garbage. Like I said before, I said it was a good idea, I never said it was well executed. So yeah, Marvel Heroes sort of falls apart at every level. It might have been more interesting if the level builder could also craft a cheap little comic book with whatever you scan in, but even though this would actually be a pretty easy system to implement, it was probably not possible due to the no doubt extremely limited time allotted for game development. As well move on to the next license, Ben 10. Hey kids, did you know that Ben 10 came out over 15 years ago? Welcome to what being old feels like. Well, at least I don't think there's any level packs in this one. I'm gonna be honest, I'm terrified whenever I change these games. I worry that just leaving this open for a little bit will get some little particle of dust to get in there and just cause the whole console to go woof! Oh, wow, these are the worst loading screens yet. There's loading screens for menus, there's loading screens for levels, there's even loading screens for loading screens. It is still loading. I've been sitting here a while. And this is just for the tutorial level. Like, part of a level. Like, these levels come in three chunks. This one, this is just the first chunk loading. That's how bad the loading screens for Ben 10 are. Ben 10 does seem to be the most fleshed out of them though. It seems to have a full-blown campaign and it looks like you can play every level just fine without needing to buy any extra cards. The included Ben card is actually used to save your progress so you can pick up where you left off. That's a good amount of content right there. So do we actually have a decent game? A diamond head in the rough? Come on, haven't you caught on by now? All the slippery controls, spotty collision, and brain-dead combat are back here in force. And considering that a number of the levels add in puzzles and tight platforming, we're in for a new brand of headache. And did I mention these stages are timed? And yeah, the jumps. This is, again, due to the unclear collision on the characters and locations. There's a reason why all of the famous side-scrolling platformers, Mario, Sonic, Metroid, Mega Man, are all flatly side-on with their level design, so it's clear where you can stand and where you can't. 
But the biggest one is that they probably committed the most grave sin of platforming game design, messing with the jump button. Now, in a platforming game, jumping is the most common action you're going to take, so where would you want to put the button for that? Maybe down here on the green button where you can easily put your thumb where it naturally is and where all of the other games we've looked at so far have placed it? <laughs> no, they put it on the red button. The one all the way up here that I have to really reach in order to get to because they added busy work to this game. You see, in this game, you also pick up objects, and for some reason, they felt that this feature was worthy in putting the spot where you normally put the jump, which, like I said before, is something you do constantly. The big gimmick of Ben 10 is that Ben uses a special watch to transform into different aliens. You'd think you'd do this by opening up the menu and selecting some kind of scan card option, right? No, that would actually make sense. In order for Ben to transform, he must first jump onto these watch platforms. Okay, now can he transform? No! First, he has to collect these cards. But I have the cards right here. Why does he need to collect them too? Okay, so now I've collected the cards and gotten on the platform and now... Wait for it. Wait for it. Time to turn up the heat blast. Yep, they weren't content to just add loading screens to loading screens, they had to add them to levels too. Swapping characters takes so long to do in this game because I guess the game is loading in the character from scratch, rather than keeping them buffered and prepared. But you haven't actually scanned in the hero, no, it turns out you also need to scan their upgrade cards. That's what the scan cards option in the menu is actually for. But what if I want to swap characters? I can't just swipe the card of a new character to do that. Oh no. First, I have to swap back to Ben. And then I have to swipe the new character. <laughs> I'm still fly, and I'm here to kick some tail. And yes, if you swap characters, you do have to swipe all the upgrades again. The same happens if you run out of time. Yes, the transformations are timed as well. I mean, I guess that's true to the show, but still, having to rescan the upgrades every time you transform is pretty bogus. And sometimes it doesn't even swap to the character you picked. The Omnitrix is a prototype and doesn't always function correctly. What? What's the point of these cards then? If I can just swap to anybody at random, why do I have to buy these cards? And if this loading wasn't enough, every time, and I mean every time you fail at a level, which again doesn't have any checkpoints, you have to hear Grandpa give his speech again. This may be a key area, if you get my drift. You can skip it, but not until after it's loaded. Whoa. And I hate to admit it, I got stuck. You see, there's a puzzle level where you drop a bunch of orbs into a hole in the floor, but when 120 seconds remain on the clock, a big blue robot busts into the wall and kills you. So what am I supposed to do? Fight the robot? Nope. Run away? Nope. Am I supposed to jump through this big hole in the wall? No. Oh, I get it! I fall through the floor! It's important to find uh, yeah, I got nothing. Okay, so it turns out the developers knew just how lousy this level's design was because there is an entire section in the manual dedicated to telling you how specifically to beat that one level. You can't just jump into the hole, you need to grab the scuba gear. You see this? This thing lying here like it's part of the background? You're supposed to grab this thing and then jump into the hole. Ugh, I've had enough. Next game. Now, it's worth mentioning that all of the games we just played were all made by the same developer, Semi-Logic Productions. The fact that all of these games have such serious performance issues can probably be tied to the fact that they were all by the same dev. 
It's possible that this is because they just weren't great at making games, but it's just as likely that they were stretched thin making so many games in such little time, meaning no room for optimization and polish, and Mattel might not have been entirely forthcoming with their console specs. Remember, they claim it's as powerful as the original PlayStation, but you can see how that adds up to yourself. I mention this because the next game is credited to an entirely different studio, Digital Eclipse, a studio that, as it turns out, is still around. Hmm, maybe we're on to something. You know, looking at a lot of these licensed things like Marvel Super Heroes and Ben 10, I can't help but think that Mattel really kind of dropped the ball on this. I mean, Mattel has a ton of their own properties, and yet they did not make any games based on them. Imagine if the Hyperscan could have gotten, like, a He-Man game, or a Barbie game, or a Hot Wheels game. They could have saved so much money on licensing, and probably made some pretty cool stuff that they could have stashed into other products. But, no, all we got is this. Although... It turns out that the Hyperscan actually does have a unique game. It's not based on any properties that they currently owned, but it is something that was developed solely for the Hyperscan. Ladies and gentlemen, let's get ready to crumble! Because it's time for Interstellar Wrestling League! Greetings and salutations, everyone! I'm Idaho Jones, ringmaster and commentator for the Interstellar Wrestling League. <laughs> I've sent a message to all wrestlers in the galaxy. Who is the biggest? Who is the fattest? Who is the meanest? Who bakes the tastiest pies? No, strike that last one. There can only be one king of the ring. Who will it be? Join me for fantastic IWL action! Interstellar Wrestling League, as its name implies, is another fighting game. You play by scanning in a character card, and there are also mod cards to power up the fighters, finishing moves for the end of the round, and ultimate versions of the character cards and... Oh no, this is just X-Men again, isn't it? Yeah, by the looks of it, Interstellar Wrestling League functions the same as X-Men as far as the cards are concerned. But hold your horses, because I see a sign of hope. I open the manual and look at the controller scheme and... What's this? Jump and duck are mapped to the control stick? Every face button is a different attack? And there's a mix of lights and heavies? These... these are fighting game controls! Somebody actually knew how to make them! Another fun little note, each of the wrestlers is listed as being either a face or a heel. This might not mean anything to most people, but it's a common term in the world of wrestling. A face is a good guy wrestler, fighting fair and standing up for the unfortunate, while a heel is a bad guy wrestler, fighting dirty and loving the sound of a booing crowd. It's a bit of an ironic naming convention though, seeing as a lot of the most famous face wrestlers wear masks, like canned heat over here. Also, there's a multi-headed wrestler who's listed as being faces, and that just made my day. It does have the fastest loading times by a long shot. This is likely because the creator, Digital Eclipse, mostly works on collections of old games ported to modern hardware. Or, put another way, they're a developer that specializes in software optimization. So let's stick to our guns and play through as Ultimate Canned Heat and... Wait a minute. Are those... What need does a robot have for... N never mind. Now, while there are still some completely broken mod cards, like one that sets your strength score to its level cap, you only get one, and the Ultimate characters only seem to get a head start in leveling as opposed to just being better character cards. There's also an MC who takes a while to introduce the fighters. If they could put heat in a can, this is what they'd call it, folks! Can heat! It's long, and the lines are unfortunately the same every time. You are going to feel the hurt. I'm going to start with your head and work my way all the way down to your heart. But it's a good thing that you can skip them. Tater that's greater with more hot fun with the IWL. Mostly. Round one, wrestle. I mean, they did record some additional lines for the wrestlers, but they barely use them at all. 
I'm tired of you bad-mouthing the canned heat. I'll show you what I'm all heated up about. You call yourself a wrestler? Well, I call you a little itty-witty baby. This is the kind of thing that you usually want to let a character cycle through as the rounds progress. As for the actual gameplay, it's better than X-Men, but not by much. Unlike the incoherent mess we saw before, your choice of attacks and moves actually seems to matter. For example, all heavy attacks create a sparking effect that lets you know to counter with a light, but it might not be as easy if you're already blocking. You also have a limited assortment of special attacks you can use. Spin cycle. Still, the game is no Street Fighter. Moves still feel like they have some lag, there is a pretty palpable lack of visual polish, characters fight back even after the game asks you to swipe a finisher card, and the cutscenes feel like they never made it past the animatic stage. It's still very, very rushed. Like X-Men, the game forces you to marathon through all 15 of its characters in its arcade mode. That's kinda weird though, as the game it derives the most inspiration from, Mortal Kombat, deliberately has a choose your destiny mechanic to choose the number of fights. All other fighting games only pit you against a sample of the roster, not the entire thing, because fighting the entire thing is freaking exhausting. The long loading times between matches certainly don't help. Not sure how Hyperscan made this mistake twice. As for the other fighters, they seem to be kind of random. You do get an eyeful of their combat stats before a match starts, but it doesn't seem to translate directly to difficulty. Some of the early fighters seem to hit well above their weight, while late game fighters simply crumble at the slightest resistance. It doesn't feel like a deep or well-programmed experience. Now, unlike the X-Men game, Interstellar Wrestling League actually has a plot. You see, it turns out Idaho Jones had put this tournament together to gather combat data on all of the best fighters in the galaxy so that he could absorb that data and become the ultimate fighter, the Ubertuber. Sure wish I was the Ubertuber. Actually, wait. Isn't that the plot for the game Dead or Alive? Anyway, it's time to fry this tater! After a very close fight, I defeat the final boss and claim my prize. An absolutely insane stat boost. Again, I wonder how many people have actually seen this ending screen. Now, ranking the games that we played today, I think Interstellar Wrestling League is probably the best crafted. It's certainly the most optimized for the system, and you always gotta give it up to a new IP. Helps that it keeps things moving by not requiring you to scan a whole handful of cards every round. Although that kind of defeats the purpose of the cards, doesn't it? I also never encountered a situation where I had to scan one of the attack mod cards. As for the game that I thought was the best idea, I actually got to give it to Ben 10. It did the hero swapping thing long before Skylanders came around and did it. And it's kind of ingenious how they got around the system's major limitation of having no internal memory storage by allowing you to save your progress by swiping the Ben card. Still, it's a good idea poorly executed, which has kind of been the theme for this video if you haven't noticed. The worst by far, Marvel Heroes. It was onto something with the story cards, but everything else was so poorly executed, including adding features that make the game actively worse, it gets the Rotten Egg Award for sure. Which leaves X-Men in this kind of sludgy, forgettable low tier, which is Honestly, probably where it deserves to be, it's pretty obvious that it's just Interstellar Wrestling League reskinned and made worse. And so, that's the fate of the Hyperscan. The tech, it turns out, works just fine. Unfortunately, even the fact that the tech works perfectly does not save it from the low quality of the games, with their wonky visuals, laggy gameplay, and loading screens so long you can take a bathroom break during them. And the cards, while a decent idea, were poorly utilized. It could be that the idea was simply ahead of its time, but so many of the cards feel like they have such little impact that they feel pointless. 
Between the bad games and the flawed monetization method, the hyperscan never really stood a chance. But again, this was not the end of the story with Toys to Life, because it would all work great when the model was refined five years later with the release of Skylanders Spyro's Adventure. Skylanders managed to avoid a lot of the technology costs by having it piggyback off of existing consoles, and it focused more on having characters that had a lot of impact, unlocking a lot of in-game features permanently. These characters also allowed players to be more expressive with their choices, as you did not need a big roster to unlock pretty much all of the game's content. Skylanders had few pieces that did a lot, Hyperscan had a lot of pieces that did little. Its competitors would improve on this, making figures of popular characters that could be used in-game, and while these would make a number of the same mistakes as the Hyperscan, they would still find success as collectibles. It's the big impetus behind the sale of Amiibo, they're little collectibles that unlock neat perks in-game, although people tend to side-eye an Amiibo that's required to unlock content. But they're far from the only ones. RFID and NFC technology has only gotten cheaper, and it's practically anywhere now. It's in phones, tablets, and the Nintendo Switch, meaning it is still more than possible for companies other than Nintendo to make stuff that uses them. A lot of them are admittedly short-sighted affairs that fall prey to common Toys to Life mistakes, or that could be done better with cheaper alternatives such as QR codes or physical bumps, but then you get stuff like what they made for Sky Children of the Light a bunch of slick merchandise that unlocks in-game cosmetic items. Far from a new idea, something usually delivered with the aforementioned codes or camera scanning features, there's just something about actually having a physical object to scan that makes it seem irresistible. Although, yeah, the stuff made for Sky Children of the Light is pretty pricey, but it's by the developers behind the legendary game Journey, so they deserve a few head pats. So, that's the story of the first Toys to Life game and console. Will we see an idea like it again? Well, we sort of already did in the form of Skylanders and Amiibo, but in order for it to really come back again, somebody will have to capture that sort of visceral joy that comes with enabling a physical object to do something cool in a digital game. But until then, the hyperscan is going to remain a cautionary tale. Until next time, this is Kodak signing off. Uh, wait, I just realized I didn't do the Spider-Man game. I mean, I looked at the prices online and they were kinda... <laughs> uh, can we just pretend that this is the Spider-Man game instead? So yeah, thanks for watching. A big thanks to all of the patrons who made this possible, specifically Team Arga, Cleeklo, and Diamond Dread, who bought the $10 and higher tier. If you want to join the Patreon, you can gain Discord access, where I'm posting stuff about the videos I'm working on, for as little as $1 a month. Also, a big thank you to Ewan Racing for sponsoring this video. Again, you can use my link in the description below to save a monstrous 30% off of your order with coupon code KODOK. Thanks again for watching, and until next time, this is KODOK signing off.